Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. You are listening to episode number 40 of the Lean Blog Podcast for April 14th, 2008. We've got kind of a different episode today. Our guest is a retired United Auto Workers member uh, who's choosing to remain anonymous um, because he's still involved with the union in retirement. And what we're going to be talking about today might be um, somewhat surprising, uh, surprisingly positive views about lean and the Toyota production system, uh, the role that uh, the union can play in in helping um, advocate for lean and Toyota production system principles for the sake of employees and and the auto industry and American manufacturing um, as as a whole. Um, What what are things that are interfering with that? How can we build trust uh, between management and employees, topics like that? So I hope you find it interesting. If you've got feedback or questions, uh, I'd, I'd invite you to go to www.leanpodcast.org, find the link to episode number 40 of the podcast, and leave your questions or, or comments there. All right. Well, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, nice to have you here with us today to talk about Lean. Glad to be here. I appreciate it, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a real interesting discussion ahead today, and, and I was wondering if you could start by talking about you know your background and, and personal experience with Lean as as a UAW employee, you know how it was first introduced and and maybe what some of your first impressions were and, and how that evolved over time. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I got about a twenty eight year uh, term with General Motors. Um, started out as naturally a factory worker. Uh, my first opportunity to serve uh, our union was as a scrap coordinator. Our plant was uh, experiencing a tremendous amount of scrap, costing us a lot of money, and they decided to put on a couple coordinators to try and pinpoint the problems. Mm-hmm. That was my first uh, opportunity to serve, service our, our union membership. And after that, I became a um, quality network suggestion program coordinator. Really enjoyed doing that. Really enjoyed serving the people. Um after that, I had the opportunity, or along with that, I should say, my uh, chairman came to me and asked me if I would represent our union as a UAW lean coordinator. Okay. I naturally uh, jumped at the opportunity and uh, had a few years to uh, learn a little bit about lean. Um, what, 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 what was the time frame for that? I'm just curious. One. That was was that role just being created? That role was just being created. Oh, it's about three years ago, four years ago, maybe four years ago. Okay. Um, and that's where I guess we start talking about how it was introduced to the plant. Mm-hmm. Technically, it was introduced to our plant probably in the early 90s, but it wasn't introduced as a lean program, mm, okay. introduced as a new operating system, a new manufacturing operating system. And it was diagnosed by our union workforce as just another program of the month, mm-hmm. so to speak. So nobody really got excited about it. They just knew that management was going to present this program and you know, we were going to have to follow through with it and do what we do best, and that's make parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, that went on for, I'd say, the, probably till 2001, 2002 time frame. And then all of a sudden, this word Kaizans popped up. Mm-hmm. It was an all-employee meeting, and we were informed that we were going to do Kaizen work. We were going to become Kaizen this, Kaizen that. And that really was the first time we've ever associated our manufacturing production system with lean. And that's when I was asked to become a UAW lean coordinator. Mm -hmm. My first problem was, well, where's my book? You know, how how do I learn this? Mm -hmm. I didn't know nothing about it. 
And I went to management, didn't get no books for management. I went to the union, didn't get no books from the union. So I ended up on the internet. Right. I basically educated myself through the internet, through uh, your lean blog, through uh, the book. I bought the book, The Toyota Way. Mm -hmm. That's basically how I educated myself so that when I went into a workshop, I could represent my people fairly. Right. Yeah. As any of everyone knows, it's union against management. And I was there to make sure management didn't run over our union people. Mm -hmm. And basically, because I was new at it, naturally, I wasn't that good. But as time went on and I became more educated, I really developed a passion for lean and a 100% believement that this is what we have to do to protect this plant and to protect our jobs. Mm -hmm. So when I stood up in front of our workforce, you know, what I preached or what I taught came from the heart. It wasn't something that just came from a book. It was something that I believe really had to take place in order to save these jobs here in America. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how it got introduced into uh, the plant I was at. Um, people will ask, well, how, how was it received? You know, how did the workforce accept it? Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't accept it too well. Okay. Why, why is that? Well, number one, we had a bunch of people that had a lot of years of service that you ever, you've probably heard the old cliche, you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, the old dog didn't want to learn no new tricks. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So we had a bunch of people in the workforce that just didn't want to change. Management did not take the time to change the culture. Mm -hmm. Didn't even attempt to change the culture. They didn't attempt to help them understand the culture that developed this process. And to me, that was a, a cardinal sin. I mean, you can't put the cart before the horse, and that's what we were trying to do. Right. I mean, as as you read the Toyota Way and educated yourself about lean, I mean, what what were the things that stood out to you that would would have to change about the culture? The things that were different between the culture in your plant and what was being described as a, a lean or or Toyota culture? I guess the biggest thing that I see that had to change was trust. Mm -hmm. We have to trust each other. We have to have a, a joint atmosphere where when management says something, the union believes it, and it is a truthful statement. It, it does it does have some validity, and that's what was lacking. I mean, it was them against us atmosphere, and every time they wanted to do something that they say improved the process, our people believed it just made us work harder. Mm -hmm. And that was things that we had to overcome. Right. And there's a, a, a long history and, unfortunately, a long track record of um, of lack of trust between the parties, right? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's just, it's just, you know, if we could establish a scenario where, a true scenario where, especially in lean, where when you improve a process, the guy next to you is not going to get laid off, mm -hmm. you know, and... I did. I had I had a, a, some training sessions to do for new hires, and one of the people raised their hand and they asked me. They said, "Well, what are you going to do when when we go out there on the floor and we improve this process that takes six people, we get it down to four people? What's going to happen to the other two? Mm -hmm. And I says to the individual, "I said, well, why do you ask that question?" Well, she says, "Because I just came from a plant." And the last job I had was we had to lean out our process. And we leaned out our process, and we had uh, eight people on it. And we leaned it down to six, and I'm one of the two that got laid off. Mm. Now, so, you know, that's not good. Right. That's, that's not a good conclusion to what should be a happy event. Right. So I spent a few minutes telling her what, my beliefs were uh, what would happen in a scenario such as that, and that is that you would be put into a bank where you would do further Kaizen events or you would do training or you would fill in for absenteeism. That, to me, is the perfect world. Um, having said that, I'll say this. 
some of our manufacturing facilities are so fat that, you know, you might have to have a layoff for there. And what was, was there anything presented to, to try to, you know, try to build some cooperation around, you know, how, how lean would be good for the customers or, or how lean might also be good for employees. It sounds like that maybe wasn't the case. Well, they were, they were always telling us that we, you know, we got to do this because if we want to get Toyota business, we got to use a similar Toyota operating system. Uh-huh. And then ours operating system wasn't called TPS, but we had to, you know, show a, version of it is that would be acceptable to Toyota if they ever wanted to come into business with us. Right. That was what we were being told. You know, we got to do this. We got to do this to compete with our neighbors down the road. And we got to do this if we ever wanted to do work for Toyota. I'm curious also that we, you said that the operating system, you know, that sounds like maybe it was lean without being called lean was put in place in the nineties. The the difference between that and when it started being called Kaizen and Lean was it was it merely a difference in name or was there some change to the approach? Well, there was a big change. Okay. There was a big push. There was a tremendous amount of involvement. Uh, a lot of workshops started popping. Uh, our biggest problem at that point was getting workers to participate in the workshops. There again, no culture change. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there was a huge amount of activity that, that all started after that initial Kaizen event started. Um, the ball started rolling and, uh, people started changing, you know, the way they did jobs. Um, some of it was kind of force fed. Some of it was kind of willingly done because they knew it was better. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, during all of this, you still had this huge cloud hanging over your head of, uh, what's the word I want? Denial. Maybe it may be a good word. The yeah. worker thinking that uh, all they're trying to do is get more out of me, you know. Mm-hmm. No belief in the fact that this is going to help keep my plan alive. This is going to give my grandkids a job. None of that was, you know, to the forefront. It was all about what are they trying to do, you know, work me in the ground. Yeah. So it sounds like trying to help coordinate and convince people that that wasn't the case, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, was a challenging role to be in. Well, it was a tremendous challenge. Uh, I took it, uh, like I said, personally, um, and I went to my people and I told them, you know, I'd rather have you mad at me today and have a job 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what got me through it was because, my job was to keep that plan open and keep as many people working as I could. Right. I believed, and I truly believe, and I still believe that lean is the way to do that. Yeah. And I, I know you're, you're very passionate about, you know, lean, uh, be, being a, a, a potentially positive force for the automakers and for manufacturing. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit some of your thoughts on, um, you know, what, what you think the, the role of lean could be and, and, and maybe what positive role that the UAW and, and other unions could have in um, help, helping spread lean? Well, I think as positive I, as I think about it, um, I do believe in it 110%. I, I, I reference the uh, comments made by uh, Jeffrey Legner numerous times on your lean blog when, when he tells us that 95% of uh, American companies say they do lean, but only 2% are less than 2% are successful. Mm-hmm. That to me is an issue. That to me has to be addressed. And whether it be the union address it or whoever, but somebody needs to step up to the plate and say, hey, this is what we got to be doing. And we got to ensure that we're doing it. We can't just stand in front of the microphones and tell corporate America that, yeah, this is what we're doing. This is, this is lean and we're practicing it. The bottom line is, is that part coming off that assembly line at tack time? Mm-hmm. And if it's not, then we got an issue. We got a problem. And if we continue to ignore it, you know, these jobs are going to continue to disappear. And so do you think, uh, you know, with, with within the plants or, um, you know, what, 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 would, what would you hope to see? In, in, in the future as far as, 
trying to help gain acceptance for lean, um, not just with, within the workforce, but also trying to help encourage and, and educate management on, on the types of changes that need to happen? Well, boy, that's about an hour long answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's not an easy question to answer. Uh, oh, but, uh, you know, I, I have to revert back to the culture. Yeah. Of management has, I shouldn't say has to drive it, but, you know, management is supposed to be driving it. Right. To me, management has to turn the triangle upside down. They have to be on the bottom, customer, and the employee has to be on top. Mm-hmm. They have to support that triangle, and they do that through financial supporting of the issues that come up in the lean process. They do that by making sound decisions to support the worker. They have to stand down there like Hercules and hold this triangle up. That's that's their role. Mm-hmm. And until they accept that role and develop that culture change, our lean attempts are going to continue to fail. Because what I see happening is in manufacturing, somebody that says, I'm going to do lean, they go in there and I always, I always use lean as a, an example of lean as a uh, cherry tree mm-hmm. full of cherries and manufacturer management goes in there to that lean cherry tree with all the different elements of lean and they start picking these elements off the low hanging branches and they start to profit from that and they show profit from it. They save a job or they eliminate a job here. They eliminate a job there and they, they show their, executive board or their profit shareholders that they just saved $80,000 a year because of that. Yeah. That's a low hanging fruit, that low hanging opportunities that they grab easily because it's there. The rest of those cherries or those elements of lean hanging around on the tree and rot. They just go to waste because they never get there. Mm-hmm. My, my theory of lean is it has to go from the front door to the back door and every, everywhere in between. Mm-hmm. You don't do that. You're kidding yourself. Yeah. You know, you're 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 going to have areas of waste. You're not going to realize the the profitability that you could or the efficiencies that you could if you picked all that fruit. Right. Did that answer your question? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I think that's um, a good diagnosis of of what happens a lot of the time. You know, where um, people are tempted to look for a quick fix. You know. Or, or find the, you know, the, the lean tool that fits into their culture. You know, exactly. any, anybody can force people to implement 5S or Kanban. Right. Um, and, and you could say, look, we're, we're doing lean, but, um, to, to step back and look in the mirror and, and try to look at, at the culture and the way people interact with each other. That, that's definitely a lot harder to do. And, and, and that it, it takes a special kind of leader to step, stand up and, and recognize and, and say we need the change. You know, when, when I was at GM, we had a, a new point manager who came in. Um, he had experience at the NUMI facility in California with the Toyota people, and he stood up in front of everybody, UAW, salaried, everybody, and he said, we need to change the management system. It's not a problem with the workers. We need, we're going to change the way we manage, and that's what's going to make us all successful. And, you know, I, that, that was a very powerful message, and, you know, I don't think – there's too many leaders, you know, that are willing to stand up and, and take that kind of responsibility, unfortunately. I think you're right. Uh, um, management has to be susceptible to change. they got to accept the fact that the worker knows something. <laughs> yes. Not just a robot punching the time clock every day to come to work. He's done that machine 10, 12, 16 hours a day in some cases, he knows that machine in a lot of cases better than the process engineer mm-hmm. and tell you when that machine isn't running right just by the sound of it. And the, they have a, an enormous tool out there for profitability, quality issues, safety issues, and they just refuse to use it because they don't want to relinquish that power. That said, I think there's still, I, I think you and I would agree, there's still hope for uh, the manufacturing world that, you know, that, that the, the message um, will start sinking in and, and that some, some change can happen. And I, I certainly hope we get a chance to 
um, have some more discussions about that. And I would certainly invite anybody listening if you have questions. Um, you know, for, for a future discussion on this topic, you can email me or, or leave a message on the blog and, you know, uh, we, hopefully we can explore this more. Well, thanks again, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity and, uh, yeah, we, we can get together again and, uh, share some more views and hopefully, uh, you know, the right people are here and, uh, lean will go forward and American commerce will prosper. Okay. Well, I hope so. So thanks again. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.